Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today we'll be discussing the important topic of gun violence in our schools and the effects of gun violence on our youth and communities. We're talking to leaders who, who work to protect our children and prevent shootings. And our special guests today are Robin Thomas, Executive Director of the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence in California, David Mooman, co-chair of the Board of Directors at March for Our Lives in New York. Paul Murray, co-founder and chairwoman at Mutant Action Alliance in Connecticut. And Lori Aladef, CEO and vice chair of the board at Make Our Schools Safe in Florida. Yesterday marked the 23rd anniversary of the Columbine High School shooting massacre, when two high school students murdered 12 students and a teacher with 21 others suffering gunshot wounds. The two students, two student perpetrators subsequently committed suicide. The largest uh, death toll over the last 22 years of school shootings was Virginia Tech. And we'll talk about Virginia Tech. In 2007, that killed 33 and the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting that killed 28 children and adults. We will be talking about the two, the 2018 attack, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland uh, shooting Florida in Florida, where 17 people were murdered, another 17 people were injured in, in, in the shooting. So just since 2020, in the last 28 months, 28 months, there have been 65 school shootings at least in, in half of the states of the union, in half of the states of the union, 65 school shootings, and 200 Americans are shot every day and injured. So that's the backdrop. That's our reality. That's where we live. We go to school, and this is what can happen. And it's not an unusual event. It's not an exception. This is every, every, every month. Robin, could you give us, and you're on mute right now, could you give us kind of a rundown of, of how you see it at the Givers Law Center, uh, the work that uh, that uh, Gabby and her husband Mark has done has been astounding, and the whole team there has really coalesced after that shooting um, in a way that that has driven this dialogue. Tell us a little bit more about how you see this issue. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. And it's really a pleasure to be here with Poe and Dowd and Lori. And it's a, it's an honor to be talking with other folks who are doing this really important, difficult work this morning. I always like to start conversations about gun violence and gun policy by saying that we do have solutions to this problem. This is a problem that has solutions. So let's start on that note of hope that we could solve this. If we had political will in this country, if there was a willingness to approach it, um, as a public health crisis and look really at the range of preventative solutions that are available, um, we could make a tremendous impact. But that's not generally how it's been approached in this country. Uh, we don't have to get too much into things like the Second Amendment this morning. I know we don't have time for those debates, but uh, there's a variety of reasons the gun industry, the Second Amendment and others, politics in America, why we're not um, doing everything that we can. Um, at Giffords, we... Well, you know, I would be perfectly willing to have an infinite number of guns if we ensure that no gun falls into the hands of people who go into schools and shoot up people and... and uh, use guns and commission of crimes and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, unfortunately, Mark, you know, there, there is as a human being making this distinction that we know who's going to commit acts of violence versus those that we know won't is a tricky one. I mean, suicide is a huge problem. Domestic violence is a huge problem. Accidents are a huge problem. Um, urban gun violence, what's happening in communities of color. So, you know, I think I hear you. And I think this idea that we could easily identify who is safe to have guns and who isn't, and, and that would solve the problem. Certainly that's a starting point And I think really important, but I think we have to look more broadly at the problem and understand each aspect of gun violence and the policy solutions that are needed to address it. So um, without taking up too, too much time, I'll just say that we approach this problem through two lenses. One is the, the policies that work, the research driven policies that we know make a difference, reduce gun violence and save lives. The second is the education and politics around it. So this question of how do you get good information out there so that Americans understand, you know, what's really going on and, and what we need 
to do in order to make those things happen. You know, there's so much misinformation. There's so much, you know, good guy with the gun is going to save the day, you know, kind of theory that the NRA is pushing and the gun industry is pushing to sell more guns that is really harmful. And the politics are really um, unfortunate because this is really a wedge political issue. And so it's leveraged um, in the political arena by those who want to mobilize a base or send a message and without consideration for the negative impact it has on so many different communities. You know, I don't think you can talk guns in schools is a huge problem and especially what's affecting children. And it's more than just the trauma and violence they experience when they have lockdown drills, when there are shootings in their schools. It's also when a classmate commits suicide with a gun or when a classmate is subject to domestic violence or when an accident happens and an intentional shooting. Um, so, you know, there's like the spread of issues and I think we approach it um, as a holistic issue. I think it's important to be willing to, uh, you know, address those nuances and look more deeply at the problem. I like seeing all the other panelists nodding. I know I'm kind of on the right track, but um, I do think it's important for folks to be willing to dig in at least a little bit to understand it and find hope in it. So I'm going to go around in, in the order that's that's actually on my screen. Lori, we're going to go to you to you next. Right. Um, we we're on track to to see 40 to, to 45,000 uh, deaths by by guns uh, this this year. And we're on track to having on average two school shootings a month in this country. This is not a theoretical problem, is it? You know, Margaret, it pains me so much to, to hear that for you to say that, you know, and I just want to take the opportunity at this time to remember my daughter, Alyssa al who was brutally murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on February 14th in 2018. And, you know, that was that was my 14 year old daughter, my only daughter who was brutally murdered and killed. So it, it pains me to know that Alyssa's death and the 16 others won't be the last and it isn't the last. And we continue to have this problem across our country. You know, you would think that with 17 people being shot and killed in their school, that we would as a country come together, find a way to solve this problem, to figure out how to create safer schools. You know, as a parent, as a mother, I sent my daughter to school on Valentine's Day and I let her out of my car and and told her I loved her. And that would be the last time that I would see Alyssa alive. Um, So I want school safety to be a priority for our country. I want people to join the school safety movement because I think the more that we could focus as a country to get behind making our schools safer, then we will actually help to solve and rectify this problem. And I'm so sorry about the loss of Alyssa. And thank you. Thank you for turning your energy. I don't know how you do it to, to this kind of advocacy. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it's a tragedy, isn't it, Doug? I mean, when you're, you're uh, younger than I am and you're closer to the, to the, to the issue. Um, I grew up in, in uh, different places and um, had different versions of this, but nothing like what, what we're seeing, uh, seeing now. How do you see this, Doug, from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, the work that March for Our Lives does is to remember kids like Alyssa, right, is to to remember that these lives were lost senselessly. These lives were lost because of the deliberate misaction of our federal government, as well as the sort of perpetuation by the gun industry. Um, For March for Our Lives, where we start in this conversation is that we have failed students, right, Um, because students we're caught in the crosshairs of, 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 of inaction and bureaucracy and red tape and economic interest. And, and here we have parents like Lori that send their kids to school in the morning without the guarantee, without the certainty that they will get to see their kids when the bell rings for dismissal. And I think for us, that's a very harrowing reality because it, you know, I grew up in a, I grew up in, in, in Salt Lake city and, you know, we, you know, 
regularly had had lockdowns because there was someone within 100 feet of the school with a gun or within 50 feet of the school with a gun. And 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 that sort of constant reality became normal almost. Right. The idea that we don't know whether or not we're going to leave school today. Right. We, we talk very specifically with our parents growing up about these issues. Right. I remember my mom would always have to somewhat warn me about these about these problems. And and it, it became more normal in our communities and in our schools than than so many other conversations that students should be having in the classroom became. Right. And so. For us, I, you know, I agree with Robin, right? We have to understand both the legislation and the policy, but also how are we doing the education culturally, politically, and socially to really help people understand this issue, right? Because with school shootings, it's, it's not this, you know, ambiguous issue that we don't know how to solve, right? We have the research, we have the data, we have the policies. And I think that what's, what's, what's really harrowing is is you know when the pandemic happened we obviously saw a, a sharp decline in, in school shootings but the gun violence became an even more dangerous problem because of the the pandemic and and it's now in a very scary place because congress hasn't federally acted in in over four years on any transformational legislation right and and i think that it's a worrisome issue because after four years after we lost 17 lives at, 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 in, at marjorie stillman and 17 more injured we've lost 170,000 americans to this issue writ large and, and and i think that this sort of inaction is 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 where we are now at it's 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 a question of calling people out because they have names, right? They have titles. We know who these people are. And, and it's a question of holding their feet to the fire because I know we're going to get into this later because we were asked to vote, right? We were asked to show up. We were asked to um, activate our communities. And, and you know, Robin, Poe, Lori, and I have done that, right? We continue to do that work in our communities. And, and here we are. So I think it's, it's really important to sh- to, to point out that these legislators have students' lives in their hands and, 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 they're, and they're, they're not acting to the best interests of them. So, Poe, you know, it, we just completed a poll and we said, are you worried that gun violence could occur at your local school? And over 90% said yes. And there's good cause to, uh, uh, for that concern. Uh, talk about the view from your uh, perspective uh, at Newton, uh, Newton, uh, Newtown um, uh, Action Alliance. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, since my neighbor killed 20 children and six educators, um, we have been working very hard to um, sound the alarm that, yes, um, if it can happen in Sandy Hook, then it can happen anywhere. You know, I am still flabbergasted by, um, you know, some responses on TV and interviews after a mass shooting or a school shooting in their communities that I didn't think this would happen in my community. And I scream at the TV. It can happen anywhere now. And since the Sandy Hook tragedy, um, over one million people in America have been shot So this is a public health emergency. It is a crisis and it is the federal government's job, their primary responsibility um, to keep us safe, particularly our children. And they have failed miserably. Um, But policies, um, like Robin said, uh, will work to prevent gun violence in the states with strong gun laws have lower gun death rates. Um, so we're working really hard because some states have great laws and other states do not. Um, so right now we know, you know, there are policies that can um, prevent school shootings. And one of them is Ethan's law. It's a law to require um, gun owners to lock up their guns when children are in their homes or if a prohibited person like someone with a mental illness or um, with felony are in the home. Uh, Recently, a U.S. Secret Service report showed that 76 percent of school shooters get their guns from their homes and 5.4 million children are living in homes right now with unsecure guns. So, yes, children all across this country are at risk for some type of violence in their schools or even in homes of their friends, their best friends. I'd like to concentrate the the discussion on on some things that we can actually do, Uh, because when you look at last year's death toll in the United States from from guns, uh, it exceeds the death toll so far in the Ukrainian war. 
it's a war zone, and our death toll on an, on an annual uh, basis has exceeded uh, that that amount, and, and and by far. And then you add the suicide uh, rate on there on top of that, and the injury rate. It's just it's just astounding that that's the price that we want to pay uh, every year. Let's take off the idea of abolishing guns and, and, and making them illegal off the table. It's it's not something that anyone is is talking about that I know of. Uh, but we are talking about taking steps that allow uh, people who want to make recreational uh, use of guns uh, just retain that that uh, that right, of course. But we want to try and constrain that. So we have Ethan's law. What other uh, what other uh, policy prescri- prescriptions, what other actions can we take? And I'm going to go back around kind of in the same way that, that we came in, uh, Dowd, then Lori, and then we're going to uh, end up with you, Robin. Dowd, what other actions can we take? And, I, I, you know, the thing that I think that is interesting about March for Our Lives is that March for Our Lives is about awareness building. It's about in-your-face communication, if I get this, this correct, about an in-your-face problem. Let's not turn away from the problem because it just didn't happen in our community because our community could be next. Am I getting that right, Don? I, I mean, absolutely. It's something, you know, Poe is saying that there is a harrowing pervasiveness to this issue, right? We don't say that every, gun violence is an everyday issue because we want some fancy tagline for our, for our organizations. No, it's the real reality that gun violence is an everyday issue in everyday communities. And, and for us, one of the ways that we see this solution actually is is the conversation at schools. You know, I think, I, I'm not sure what the consensus of the call is, but however, you know, we've seen that, you know, school resource officers, for example, is a conversation we need to rethink because it's 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 something that hasn't kept our kids historically safe in the schools, right? Uh, you know, the, the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, there was a school resource officer there that was, responsibility was to protect those children. And and you, you see that we, can, we have to think about gun violence through prevention and not only reaction, right? So how are we investing in in, in school resource and in, in, in you know school nurses, school psychologists and and, and faculty that can really ensure that our, first of all, our children are going to schools that are safe, right? But then also, how can we um, engage with faculty and parents and community members, right, as a part of the solution to, to ensure that they are doing the education? Because um, if our kids are, don't know about these issues, right, um, they're, they're in even even more scary position because um, the numbers that Poe listed off were worrisome to me, for sure. And, and and so for March for Our Lives, we really want to think about how can we, how are we doing prevention work? So, right, that, that, that is a conversation about also who are we giving guns, giving guns to, right? Who, who is not properly storing their guns? These pieces of legislation not, are not only are low hanging, right, but they're high impact. And, and they so can your, your aim uh, is, to, is to build a movement. Your aim is to do mo- movement building. To I mean, sure. Uh, but however, I think that uh, it, we'd be remiss to ignore the sort of real material responsibilities that we have as an organization to advocate for, for funding, for resources and for legislation and policy as well. And Lori, what, what is the material thing that we need to do as a society? What should I be doing um, uh, after 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 this show? What what should our governments be doing? Well, one I'd like to just focus on, on parents. I think it's important for parents to be the first line of defense, check their kids' backpacks before they go to school um, because we need help. I'm also a school board member for Broward County Public Schools. And it's really important too that parents are looking at their students' social media. They know what's going on. And if they see something, say something. We're uh, we are stopping violence from happening before it happens. We're stopping suicides from happening because students, parents, they are watching and they're reporting it and and help. And we're getting help for our students. Mental health, I think, is a really important aspect that also at the state level and the uh, government at the federal level, it needs to be funded. Uh, we need to be able to reach students, connect with students, give them that those wraparound services and really help to find the fundamental underlying problems that our students are having. So we're able to prevent violence from happening before it happens. And one of the um, laws that we helped pass was Alyssa's law, which allows mass notification 
for teachers to have their own panic button. So if there is a life threatening emergency situation on campus, whether it's a medical emergency or an active shooter situation, the teacher can push a button on their phone or a hardwire button or something they wear around their neck, like a badge, and it's directly linked to law enforcement. So we've passed Alyssa's law in New Jersey and also here in Florida. And then we have a federal bill called the Safer Schools Act, where we're trying to pass Alyssa's law as a standard level of school safety and protection across the country for every school. So this is this is all we're talking a lot about response. Um, one of the things, though, that I've noted is that if you take a look at the volume of guns in this country and uh, new gun sales, and then you you step you wait a beat and you see what happens, um, what you what you actually see is this northward uh, creep of the statistics. There is a a relationship between the vol- just the sheer volume of guns that are there that are in this country and the um, the number of deaths and the number of injuries. Um, how do we deal with that, uh, Robin, that, that, that inextricable link between the availability of guns and the context in which guns are uh, distributed in this country and the, the lack of, for example, a universal requirement that you get firearms training uh, or, or the lack of a universal requirement that, that there's be, there'll be a background check, lack of a universal requirement that there'll be a waiting period. Um, it, it just seems that... The, the whole approach right now is, is one in which the downstream um, recipients of gun violence are trying to manage uh, that process, but we're not doing anything to, um, to ameliorate it upstream. I think that's a really good point. I want to say two things. One is that there are specific policies that we could look to that are effective at preventing specifically things like school shootings. So we've already talked a little bit about safe storage laws, Ethan's law. Um, There's also child access prevention laws, extreme risk protective order laws, which are laws which identify people who are in a temporary time of crisis and remove guns from them. Um, these laws are have been passed in, uh, you know, 20 odd states since, um, well, in the last few years now, we haven't in 20 states, but a large number since the shooting at Parkland. So um, we call them ERPOs, risk protective order laws, um, minimum age laws, laws that prevent folks under 21 years old from acquiring weapons, particularly the most dangerous weapons. So there's specific laws that we can look to and policies that are effective at this particular problem of preventing school shootings. Um, But we track more than 50 different categories of laws. And I think you pointed out, you know, safety training, background checks. Um, You know, there are countries that have high gun ownership rates and do not have the gun violence problem that we do. You know, Canada and Switzerland and Israel, there's lots of countries that do actually have high civilian gun ownership, even um, Australia, which has a lot more restrictions um, after the shooting at Port Arthur. So, You know, looking at that comprehensive approach, California actually has a very robust model and very low gun death rates, especially when you consider guns are trafficked into California from elsewhere. So there's this really interesting correlation. We do a mapping. We we grade the states every year. We look at the strength of the gun laws in each state. We sort of analyze each state, what they're doing and what they're not doing. We give them a grade and then we look at their gun death rates. And you can go to our website and check that out. I think it's a really fascinating, um, informed place. We call it our report card, gun, state gun law report card. And when you look at the states with strong gun laws, which very often are also states with lower gun ownership rates, there are much lower gun death rates. So, you know, there really is a correlation. We don't use the word causation because it's sort of a complex statistical analysis, but there's a correlation between stronger gun laws and lower gun death rates. So we know that these laws work even in a country with porous borders. Um, and I think Poe mentioned it earlier. This is a public health crisis in this country. The number of people, um, you know, you said 200 a day. It's actually much higher if you include all the categories of gun violence, suicide, et cetera. So, you know, with more than 40,000 people dying, well over 120,000 people shot every year. It's a tremendously impactful crisis on every community in America in one way or another. And a public health approach would be one where we look, as you said, Mark, at how to prevent the violence itself. And we have lots of tools for that. 
Yes, safety training, you know, community violence intervention, education, safe storage. You know, I could go on and on. As I said, we track 50 different areas of gun regulation, and we should be looking at implementing all of those across the country. And I think we'd see dramatic difference. Well, and I think that your point that that uh, countries like Switzerland and, and Israel, they're not anti-gun. Everybody in Switzerland, well, everybody I know in Switzerland knows a gun, right? And, and they have to, you know, there's military training and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I think that, that uh, one of the questions that, that I'd like to talk about uh, now, because we are coming to the end of our time, going to extend a little bit, um, is this question of power. Because it seems that, that and it's been, it's been mentioned a number of times by each of you in different ways, that we seem to be the victim of the use of this issue of guns as a meme, as, as a way to accumulate power. Um, and the downstream impact is that nothing gets done or, or little gets done. Action is slowed. And with this, um, this issue being used uh, to the effect of, of having one party or another, or one senator or congressperson accumulating power versus another, it seems that what's happening is that we're, we're, we're going to use that tool for this purpose while uh, these death rates and injury rates are so high. Poe, how do you look at what is going on in this debate and, and how do we get beyond it? How do we create the cost of using this issue as a power accumulator to be so high on all sides that it cannot it becomes radioactive. Using this issue simply to stymie, simply to take no action, that comes with a cost. How do we do that? Well, Mark, I think it's happening already. Um, when you know you just did that poll, do you think that your child will get shot? Um, and yes, um, you know we need that secondhand smoke moment when the majority of Americans feel like they may lose their lives or their child's or their loved one's lives. And it's getting to that point with 30%, uh, 36% increase in gun deaths since the Sandy Hook tragedy to now. Um, majority of the communities and families all ac across the country are feeling the impact of gun violence. And most of our children are going to schools learning, um, you know, to be, uh, I mean, learning about lockdown drills, et cetera, and, and they're being traumatized. So um, most everyone is being impacted. So we need to um, remember that um, we do have the power. You know, we have a voice, we have a vote. We need to ensure that we vote for candidates who will support um, sensible legislation, all the policies that Robin mentioned. And, um, you know, it's happening. We had a, a little setback uh, during the Trump years because he was in the pockets of the NRA and the NSSF, the National Shooting Sports Foundation and other gun lobby groups. But we need to dismantle you know, the, the stranglehold from the gun lobby, because the majority of Americans already support common sense gun laws, including background checks, red flag laws, and uh, even assault weapons ban. So it's a, it's a small number of politicians on Capitol Hill who are not on our side. And once that flips, we're going to be we're going to be able to see dramatic changes in um, how we deal with this issue. We're going to uh, go to you, uh, Dowd, Robin, and Lori, we're going to give you the last word. Uh, Dowd, how, how do you see this, this uh, us making the use of this as a, a, a power accumulator on any side, uh, radioactive, so that people tend towards solutions and compromise rather than uh, being frozen in, in behind barricades? I think it's the um, conversation with the everyday American that agrees with us, like Poe said. It's it's building the, the base of people that are demanding that their legislators on the federal and state level d are doing this work, right? Because um, when we change people, we change policies. I think that was one of the most powerful things about March for Our Lives' work is that we galvanized the country with over 800 marches around the world of people saying that enough is enough. And, and that was something that helps propel the work forward for so many organizations. And, and I think that's what we need to 
to continue doing is, is how can we get to the people that are the most impacted? How can we get to parents and faculty and students? How can we get to, uh, you know, parents that have lost their children um, to school shootings? I think getting everyday people to really be angry about this issue is a really powerful thing because people feel it, right? And, and, and people know that this issue, but we want people to be activated. We want people to go out. We want people to organize. We want people to do their research. God knows how many times Gifford's Law Center has saved my ass. Um, and it's like, and it's really important that, um, like it, that, that we really get the everyday person mad about this issue because um, Congress has, has had the luxury of, of, of being able to, you know, push us off to the side because, you know, we don't have as much uh, power and anger on our side. And I think that it's really important that we get that base back. We get people this midterm to get really angry and to understand that this is a real issue on our hands um, because we, we have the ideas, right? We, we know the solutions, we know what we need to do, and we need to get politicians on our side that, that are willing to be as committed and as dedicated. But that starts with us, everyday people that are angry enough to make change and to make it consistent. Um, and and it's, it's really important that groups like this stay strong and stay together because we're the ones that are in, these, in, in the faces of these people every day. It's letting them know that we need to get activated. We need to take this issue seriously. So um, that's what I would say in terms of building power is, is getting the everyday person the education they need and, and the action steps that they need to, to, to do something about this problem. Because we need all of us. So your attention, our attention span, our advocacy, our vote is going to get us the country that we're going to have. And Robin, you endorse that, right? I mean, it really does. What you're saying, what Dowd's saying um, is we need to pay attention to this issue. We need to advocate. We need to not let it go. And you've done exactly that at the Giffords Law Center. Yeah, our um, our partners at Gifford spend all of their time looking for champions on this issue. The brave folks out there that are advocating for this change, you know, they know it's going to draw heat from the other side. So one of the things we're all committed to is making sure that our champions have support, that they have votes, that they have money, that they have, um, you know, the kind of messaging support that they need to be able to go out there and really take the lead in fighting for this. Um, it's a tough issue to lead on, but but I will say this in the last couple of elections, when they do exit polls and they talk to voters about what issues are really important to them and what sits at the top of their sort of personal um, priorities, guns and gun violence and gun policy has moved way up. It used to not even be on the list. Now it usually comes in first, second or third for most people um, because it does. It is something that we worry about and that touches our lives. So it has become a voting issue. It used to be one where politicians would never talk about things like gun policy. In, you know, in a campaign. And now everyone's talking about it. We did a presidential forum um, before the last presidential election. All 10 Democratic candidates showed up to the forum to talk about their position on gun policy. That is not something that would have happened in the past. So while we're not seeing the kind of change at the federal level yet that we know we need to and we want, we are seeing a lot of change in how politicians talk about this and what they campaign on. And then who's winning? I mean, we have, you know, Lucy McBath in Georgia in a conservative district running as a gun safety champion and winning. Um, so, you know, things are changing. It's we're not quite there yet. I think we're really, really close, but um, we are seeing a tremendous amount of movement. You know, this is an issue that has changed dramatically um, in electoral politics over the last decade. And that gives us a lot of hope. And it, it is because of the students at March for Our Lives who are mobilizing their generation to vote. It is the folks who, who unfortunately, you know, experience Newtown experience experience Parkland and who now that it's touched their lives can't make it someone else's issue anymore. And so, you know, with 120,000 people shot, that's the case in so many communities across the country. And it means that more and more people sadly do sort of terribly um, care because it is so prevalent. And uh, Lori, um, we, we just finished a poll. We said, who should our legal system um, be able to hold responsible when a student commits a school shooting. And here's what I found to be very interesting. We gave a number of different single options, school perpetrator, the parents of the student, the school, the manufacturer. And then we gave two, two items that were somewhat different. Any combination of, these, of the perpetrator, the parents in the school. And then we separately gave the option of everybody, <clears throat> including the manufacturer. 64% said it's everybody. And I'll add myself to that list. I'm responsible too. 
I'm responsible for the reason that Dowd said, I need to advocate. I need to vote. I need to be there, be out there talking about this and becoming involved. Lori, what is your admonition to us to break this logjam? How do, how do we do it? How do we, we go about this? As the voice of, of a parent who has lost a child, as the voice of your child, as the voice representing others who have suffered through this, this issue. So I definitely think it is voting, getting out, being an informed voter. That's really important, knowing who you are actually voting for into office and knowing what they stand on all of the issues. Having a voice, being at your school board meetings, speaking up, see something, say something. And, you know, and don't stop because, you know, one of the things I always continue to say is your voice is your power. And, and I think whether you are a student, if you're a, a parent, uh, you're on the PTO, or you just have to be able to continue to be an advocate, be a voice for school safety, be a voice for change. And, you know, we, we can't just wait for the next school shooting to happen before we pass major legislation. I mean, after February 14th, we, the families that, that lost seven, you know, that lost a loved one, we helped pass the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act. That was the first time here in Florida where this, you know, major legislation for gun safety was, was passed, but it shouldn't take such violence for these laws to, to happen to change. You know, I moved to Parkland because it was considered the safest city. And of course we were gonna send our kids to public school. So I would never have imagined um, Alyssa being, being shot eight times in her English classroom. And so it shouldn't have to take this to happen before change to happen. So be a voice now. You know, a lot of times we're in our own little bubbles. Get out of your bubble and, and make things happen now. Such an important point. And, and again, I'm so sorry for the loss uh, of Alyssa. And thank you. Thank you for being that voice that we so desperately need. Robin Thomas, Executive Director of the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence in California. And Don Woman, co-chair of the uh, Board of Directors at March for Our Lives in New York. Paul Murray, uh, co-founder and chairwoman at the Newton, Newtown um, Action Alliance in Connecticut. And Laurie Aladoff, uh, CEO and uh, vice chair of the board at Make Our Schools Safe in Florida. Thank you so much for sharing the, the amazing work of your organizations, the tragedy that can be converted into change that we so desperately need. Please thank your staffs. Please thank your parents. Please thank your, your communities for the work that you're doing for, and your funders. Uh, have a great day. Everybody stay safe. And, and thank you so much.